Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we riff, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo, right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Child's Play The Fan Novelization of the First Movie by Jeremy Terry Chapter 4 The Nine O'Clock News Isn't this something, Maggie thought, as she picked up another crumb of chocolate cake from the piece she'd cut for herself and shoved it in her mouth. You're 30 years old, single, and the only thing you have to do is babysit? You're going to end up an old cat lady if you aren't careful, girl. That might be true, but as family went, this wasn't bad at all. She really enjoyed when Andy called her Aunt Maggie and hugged her. Children love so completely, without fear of rejection, and without worrying about what others would think of them. Maggie thought there might be a lot to learn there. Adults spent more time posturing than being truly honest with themselves about their true feelings. She glanced down at the cake, frowning. To eat the whole cake or not, that was the question. Not, she decided. She could try to eat her feelings away, but she knew the loneliness would remain. She picked the plate up and dumped the half-eaten slice in the trash bin. Noise from the living room. She leaned over and saw Andy sitting in the middle of the room with his new tool set spread around him, and the television set turned to a game show. The good guy doll sat against the sofa beside Andy, seeming to watch as he played. God, look at that orange hair and all those freckles. That is one ugly doll. Oh well, she said to herself, as she picked up a stack of clean dishes from the dish drainer and carried them towards the cabinet. The kitchen isn't going to clean itself. Andy grabbed his hammer and plastic nail and began to drive the nail into a toy board before dropping it and taking up a small toy handsaw. See, Chucky? This is how you use a saw. He scraped the dull saw teeth over the board, enjoying the clicking sound they made. One day I'm going to have a real tool set, he thought. Then I'll be able to make all kinds of neat stuff. Suddenly, the game show on the television faded into a hiss of white noise and was replaced by a newsman in fancy clothes who seemed to be staring right at Andy. Andy didn't like the news. All they ever talked about was boring stuff. He dropped the saw and picked up a screwdriver. Breaking news, said the newscaster in his all-so-serious voice. Eddie Caputo, reputed accomplice of the deceased Lakeshore Strangler Charles Lee Ray, has just escaped from the 34th Precinct Jail. More details on the news at 9. 
Andy heard a small click and looked up to see Chucky staring wide-eyed at the TV. Andy frowned and tapped the doll on the foot with a screwdriver. Hey, Chucky! You're not watching me! Chucky looked at the newscaster for a long moment and then turned his head to Andy and said, Hey, wanna play? Maggie finished rinsing the stew pot and put it in the drainer. Sighing, she wiped her hands on a dish towel. Washing dishes by hand was a drag. She'd have to talk Karen into investing in a dishwasher if she was going to keep up this babysitting gig. She glanced at her watch and saw that it was past 8.30. Time flies when you're having fun. It's past Andy's bedtime. She walked through the archway into the living room, surveying the clutter of toys. It's time to clean up, sport. I let you stay up past your bedtime. Andy said okay, gathering up his tools and putting them in the bag that served as their new home after he took them out of his new lunchbox. Finished cleaning up, he held the bag under one arm and picked Chucky up with the other. He took a step and then paused to lean closer to the doll as if it were whispering in his ear. Kids and their imaginations, she thought with a smile. Andy looked up at her. But Aunt Maggie, Chucky wants to watch the 9 o'clock news. Sure he does, Maggie said. She snapped off the television and picked Andy up. He lost his grip on the doll and it tumbled to the floor to land on the top of its head. Its butt aimed up at her like it was mooning her. Chucky! Andy shouted, squirming in her arms. Maggie leaned down and picked up the doll by one of its red sneakered feet. Oh yes, we can't forget about Chucky. She carried them down the hallway, Chucky's head bouncing repeatedly off the hardwood floor, and deposited Andy outside his bedroom door. She handed Chucky over and then pointed to the bathroom. And now, young man, it's brush your teeth and under the cover time for you. Go put your toys away and then brush those puppies. Yell for me when you're ready to be tucked in. Andy set Chucky down in the rocking chair beside his bed and then walked to the closet to put his tools away. Chucky turned his head to watch, seeing where Andy put the bag. Andy turned back and saw Chucky watching him. He smiled. Hey Chucky, you want to see my room? Andy took Chucky's stare as a yes, so he started around the room pointing out the treasures he'd collected. Chucky's eyes followed him every step of the way. This is my train set. And this is my electric car. And this is the baseball bat my daddy gave me last Christmas. He was going to teach me to play baseball, but he was too busy. Now he can't. He walked over to his bedside table and picked up the small framed photograph and showed it to Chucky. This is my dad. His name was Robert, but mommy called him Bob. He died in a car wreck, so he's in heaven now. Mommy says he's looking down and watching out for me. I miss my daddy. Andy put the picture back down and then walked to the bedroom door. Okay, you stay here while I brush my teeth. Chucky stared for a moment and then turned his head to Andy's bed. Maggie opened the refrigerator and pulled out a half-empty gallon of whole milk and carried it over to the kitchen island where a glass set waiting to be put to good use. She heard first one door and then another open and then water running in the bathroom sink. You brushing your teeth, Andy? She shouted. Andy's reply came a moment later, muffled by toothpaste and brush. Yes, Aunt Maggie. Good boy. She poured the milk and was crossing the kitchen to put the jug back when the television in the living room suddenly burst into life. She gasped, nearly dropping the jug. What the hell? She set the milk down on the counter and inched towards the archway. The sound of water still came from the bathroom. Andy finishing his nighttime routine. So if this wasn't Andy, then who could it be? Police say Caputo escaped from the prison transport bus in transit to his arraignment. 
said a voice from the television. A massive search has begun. There was a heavy glass rolling pin on the counter by the stove. Maggie glanced over at it, wishing she had thought to grab it before investigating. Too late now. She eased into the living room, her arms raised to fight, and then let them fall to her sides in exasperation. The doll was sitting on the couch facing the TV, as if it were actually watching. Aunt Maggie, Chucky wants to watch the 9 o'clock news. Cute, she muttered. She walked over to the TV and switched the set off before grabbing the doll once again by the leg and carrying it down the hall. Andy was just coming out of the bathroom and he stared at her and Chucky in confusion. Well, young man, Maggie said, her free hand on her hip. What do you have to say about this? About what? Come on, she said, taking him by the hand and leading him into his bedroom. You have to learn when I say something, I mean it. What did I do? You know very well what I'm talking about, turning the TV on and putting Chucky in front of it when I told you it was time to go to bed. Andy frowned, looking back and forth between Maggie and Chucky. I didn't do that. Oh, no? Maggie asked, motioning Andy towards his bed and pulling back his covers. What did Chucky do? Walk into the living room and turn it on by himself? Andy sat on the edge of the bed and looked up at Chucky's upside-down face. Did you do that, Chucky? Wow, he's really trying to sell this thing, isn't he? Andy, stop it! She put Chucky under the blankets beside Andy and tucked them both in tight. But, Auntie... Nope, she said, kissing her fingertips and placing them on his forehead. Not another word. But I didn't put Chucky in front of the TV. She moved her fingers to his lips. Shh, enough already. Good night, Andy. Happy birthday. Good night, Aunt Maggie. She turned off the lights and walked from the room. Andy watched her go and then turned to kiss Chucky on the cheek. See, Chucky, I told you she'd be mad if you watched the news. Andy rolled over on his side, his back to Chucky, and closed his eyes. Five minutes later, his breathing had slowed with the arrival of sleep. Chucky's eyes shifted to stare at the closed bedroom door. Chapter 5 Maggie The harsh north wind blew around the eaves, moaning like the souls of the damned, and Maggie shivered. She reached down to the end of the couch and grabbed a soft quilt that had been sewn together by Karen's grandmother before she was born. Maggie wrapped it close about her, savoring the warmth, and then picked up the book she'd been reading. She found it on Karen's bedside table and had been intrigued by the blurb on the dust jacket, so she decided to give it a try. Sitting alone in the quiet apartment with most of the lights off, she thought it might not have been such a good idea. She opened the book and continued to read about a little boy named Georgie and the paper boat his big brother Bill made for him. It had been raining for days, and the gutters were overflowing like swift running rivers, the perfect environment for a kid with an imagination. Maggie turned the page. Georgie's boat was out running him. He looked ahead and saw the rushing water disappearing down a drain into the sewers under the street. Georgie picked up his pace, but it was too late. With a cry, he leaned down to stare after the lost SS Georgie and gasped when he saw something staring back. Maggie pulled her feet under her butt, superstitiously afraid that something might be reaching from beneath the couch with cold, dead fingers to grab her toes. It was a clown. A clown. A fucking clown. She hated clowns. Had since she was a little girl, and one had frightened her at a carnival. This Stephen King sure knew how to push the right buttons. She heard the creak of a floorboard and spun around in time to catch a glimpse of something blue and red passing by the archway to the hall. She folded a page corner to mark her spot and lay the book down on the sofa. Something scraped across the floor. I saw something blue. Andy's pajamas are blue and red. They look just like his doll's outfit. Andy? Is that you? Who else would it be, girl? Chucky, get a grip. Pretty soon you're going to be seeing Pennywise under the kitchen sink. She walked slowly out into the hall, 
glanced to her right and saw that Andy's bedroom door was cracked open. She turned left and froze. A chair had been pulled in front of the apartment door and someone had undone the chain lock. This wasn't funny anymore. Andy was about to see a different side of Auntie Maggie if he was running about playing games. She strode to the door and saw that the deadbolt was unlocked as well. Andy wouldn't go outside at this time of night, would he? She reached for the lock and let loose a scream when something crashed to the floor in the kitchen behind her. She spun around, scanning for an intruder, and saw only the empty hallway. Still, the atmosphere felt different, as if something malevolent had found its way in. The air moved against her skin, sending goose flesh down her spine, and suddenly she knew that she and Andy were not alone in the apartment. Andy? No response, except did she just hear something shift in there? She felt the door at her back. Could she reach Andy and get back to the door before whoever it was pounced on the two of them? She tiptoed towards the kitchen door, her heart pounding in her chest, sweat beating on her forehead. She remembered the glass rolling pin on the counter. That would do nicely for whoever had come calling uninvited. She took a deep breath to still her nerves and then charged around the corner. The kitchen was empty. She flicked on the lights and saw a large pile of sugar spread across the island and on the floor beside a broken jar. Now how did that happen? The telephone rang shrilly behind her, and she nearly jumped out of her skin. She twisted around, yanked the receiver from its cradle, and held it to her ear. Hello? A low hiss came from the phone, as if the wind had found its way into the phone lines. And then, a familiar voice spoke into her ear. Hey, how's it going? How's Andy? Karen? Yeah, who else would it be? Is something wrong? Maggie closed her eyes and sighed, feeling some of the tension leave her taut muscles. Oh, oh no, everything is fine. Something strange just happened, that's all. What do you mean? What's going on? Nothing. I've just got a good case of the alone at night willies. I'll tell you all about it when you get home. Now do me a favor, quit worrying, and go give Criswell a good kick in the ass for me. Karen laughed. You got it. Hey, listen to me. Thanks again for watching Andy. You're a real pal. Oh, yeah? Maggie said. You know it, Karen replied. Give Andy a kiss for me. Bye. The phone went dead in her ear, and Maggie hung it up. He watched the bitch from his hiding place beneath the table in the hallway. She never would have dragged him around as she knew who she was dealing with. Now it was time to show her. He gripped the hammer in his small hand, felt its reassuring weight. It would do the trick. The woman was getting over her fright. She rationalized the chair, the spilled sugar. Little Andy's gonna be in for it. That was if he let her live long enough. Too bad. Her time is out. She paused in the middle of the kitchen with a broom and dustpan in her hand, staring at three wooden planters nestled under the apartment windows. Andy, are you hiding back there? She asked. I'm going to paddle your behind if you are. She crept up to the planters with their half-dead ferns on top and yanked one aside. There was nothing there. She put the planter back down, her shoulders slumping. Everything was all fine in her world. What's wrong with me, she said. I'm scaring myself to death. She was turning. It's time. He burst from under the table, amazed at how effortless sprinting was in spite of his short legs. He leapt on a bar stool and mounted the island, the hammer raised over his head. She saw him and her eyes went wide with shock. He brought the hammer down as hard as he could, the blow landing above her left eye. He heard the bone break and then she was spinning away towards the windows, pinwheeling her arms for balance. 
The glass gave way beneath her weight, and then she was falling. He heard her scream, and then a crash as she landed on top of a parked car on the street below. Laughing maniacally, he climbed down from the island and looked out the shattered window. Glass from the apartment windows and from the destroyed car littered the sidewalk and street, looking like little tongues of fire under the streetlights. She lay face down on top of the caved-in vehicle, a growing pool of blood seeping from her ruptured cranium and bowels. There's nothing like a good bludgeoning to get the old juices flowing. <laughs> he cackled. He tossed the hammer behind the planters as he passed and then padded down the hall back to Andy's bedroom. Okay, Slashaholics, that was chapters 4 and 5 of Child's Play, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed tonight's chapters. Again, as always, Garbage Pell Queen, great job as Andy. Whoever's voicing Chucky, welcome to the show. You did a great job. Yeah, I know, that was me. And I know some people think I sound like a, uh, what was the insult I got back on Child's Play 2? I think it was, um... He, cut, he said I sounded, some, some troll said I sounded like a gay Jack Nicholson on Family Guy. Well, you know what? I have fun voicing Chucky, and that's all that matters. I'm sorry if it's not close enough to Brad. Uh, I'm doing the best I can. God damn it, I'm trying, okay? But uh, I want to know what you guys thought. I really did enjoy not just getting the scene from the movie playing out uh, like, like novelizations do, but Jeremy took us into the head of not only Maggie and what she was feeling whenever she was seeing all this stuff happening and her irritation thinking it was Andy. But I love the Stephen King cameo thing with the It book, and I love, absolutely love, that we got to get into Chucky's head. You know, we're not going to play the guessing game like the movie did. Is it Andy? Is it the doll? Uh, we already know it's the doll, so I'm really looking forward to this to see how it goes on from here. It was fun getting into Chucky's head for that small moment for his first kill as the doll, and uh, I can't wait to see what happens next time. What's going to be on his mind whenever he's going out to find Eddie? You know, whenever he's trying to find uh, Andy, whenever Andy's being held at the hospital. So many possibilities coming up. Uh, always thought Maggie's death was brutal, gruesome. Played out really well in the book. Amazing job, Jeremy. Everybody, let me know what you think of the book so far, if you're enjoying the narrations and Jeremy's story. And I'll be back very soon with more of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry very soon. Until then, be excellent to each other. And always remember, you can't keep a good guy down. <laughs>